Check. We're back here at the Stanley John Odlam Memorial Secondary School for the live broadcast. Welcome back to HGS's live coverage of the 2018 convention of the United Workers Party, the party's 40th convention. We're here at Marigo at the Stanley John Odlam Memorial School. Uh, earlier today, for the first segment or the first session, we, we had the endorsement of the executive. But the highlights for this afternoon's session is supposed to be the feature address by the Prime Minister of Grenada, Dr. Keith Mitchell. We just witnessed a very hearty welcome being bestowed on him, so to speak, as he was brought on stage here. This is going to be the feature for this afternoon. And so, so far today, it has been a very lively session, and the persons are just, basically, you've just had a call to order, and persons are just settling in, preparing for the afternoon session. The first the first item on today's, this afternoon's agenda is a feature presentation basically highlighting all of the achievements of the United Workers Party in government. So we invite you to join us and to partake in this. Culture, which has seen more farmers returning to the fields. In 2018 alone, more than $47 million has been injected in the industry, resulting in increased are much like marriage vows. They are made at the beginning of the relationship between candidate and voter. And during the lifespan of the marriage, not all accomplishments will continuously be listed. In our first two years of marriage, we guaranteed five to stay alive. And before our one year anniversary, there was VAT reduction, an amnesty of hospital bills, reduced vehicle license fees. We froze property tax, and of course, we doubled the school freedom program and transportation subsidies. We have doubled the budget allocation for agriculture, which has seen more farmers returning to the fields. In 2018 alone, more than $47 million has been injected in the industry, resulting in increased production, more exports, and new markets in the UK and France. Thanks to the UWP government, farmers now have insurance and a pension scheme. And thanks to Izikel's hard work, Senusha and Taiwan have joined forces for the creation of agro-processing plants for local juices, chocolate, and ice cream. When Herman Gill took the oath, he was committed to reopening the forensic lab. And he did. Committed to appointing a DPP, more magistrates and judges. And he did. Herman ensured the renovation of the Sufer Fire Station. 100 new fire officers were hired. 15 new police officers are now on the beat. The cops got 25 more vehicles. A parole board has been appointed. Now, 
He is working on a new police headquarters and a criminal high courthouse. Not forgetting the four new engines he secured for the Coast Guard. But it wasn't only law enforcement smiling. Locals and visitors got some soleil. The budget for Carnival was increased from $1 million to $3 million under the UWP administration. We increased the budget to Jeune Creole from an anorexic $100,000 a year to $600,000. And of course, we increased and improved the elderly care program. From the onset, we were committed to reducing unemployment and the statistics department says it is the lowest it has been for the past seven years. Always a visionary, our leader ensured support for the solar farm in VA4 and all measures were put in place to increase the competitiveness of the Citizenship by Investment program. Dialysis patients can now be dialyzed in the comfort of the EU Owen King Hospital. We have started work on the Denry Polyclinic, increased working hours at the Grosley Polyclinic and have partnered with the Starkey Heron Foundation to provide over 600 St. Lucians with free heron aids. With an educator and academic at the helm of the education department, in one year, the UWP government has spent over $10 million on school refurbishments the introduction of digital literacy programs and developed a comprehensive plan to rehabilitate all schools. Edmund Essefan secured partnership with the FIFA Gold Project in Denry. He also established a national sports academy, secured a major expansion of the after schools program, and at present is undertaking major upgrades to all sporting facilities island wide to international standards. Infrastructural improvements and maintenance crisscross the island, from repairs on the Badalil to the rehabilitation of the Rosovana Highway. The Saltibus Road looks like new, the Canaries Bridge is up and running, and the Tomazo Bridge is near completion. And over 12 new bus stops have been installed on the Grosley Highway. And as if that was not enough, the housing minister ensured that hundreds of St. Lucians now have their own piece of paradise. Tourism is on the rise, and in 2017, St. Lucia recorded the highest number of stay-over visitors in history. Our government continues to invest and ensure the fertile economic space, which allows the Domani Resort development and the Fairmount Hotel in Chozel to thrive. Our government allowed phase one of the village tourism project to be introduced. We have secured a new airlift with Inter-Caribbean Airways, Thomson Airlines, and a new JetBlue service. And this government, under the leadership of Alan Chastney, has secured the financing for the redevelopment of the Hiranora International Airport. And we're just warming up. The Pearl of the Caribbean will be a reality. The master plan for V4 will be a reality. More St. Lucians will be employed, and our commitment to this marriage will be for good times and for trying times together, as we strive to make St. Lucia the best place to live, to work, to invest, and the best place to call home. Prime Minister Keith Mitchell has to leave by four, so we want to um, move his presentation before we do the awards. I would now like to call on Senator Fortuna Belrose to uh, introduce our esteemed guest speaker, Senator Belrose. My flabo. Ah, bon. Boudin sont plein. Bon, nous allons faire plus plein après midi. Les autres qui étaient ici, les autres qui sont si bon. Ah. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our party, the People's Party, the United Workers' Party is focused on the winning formula. And you heard our political leader earlier 
You heard the chairman of the party earlier. Losing is not an option for this United Workers Party. Losing is not an option for this United Workers Party. And so today, I am honored to present to you someone who has mastered the art of winning and is ideally positioned to offer his guidance and support as we seek to implement better policies for better lives. You know, by way of background, our guest speaker was born in Brisbane, St. George, Grenada. He received his primary school education at a school called the Happy Hill RC School and the J.W. Fletcher Memorial School. He went on to the Presentation Brothers College, then to the University of the West Indies, that's the Cable Campus, where he gained a bachelor's degree of science, sorry, a science degree in mathematics and chemistry, and that was in 1971. He then followed that up with a master's degree from Howard University in 1975, and in 1979, he attained a doctorate in mathematics and statistics from the American University. He's an avid cricketer, and that's where I know him. He was a member of the Grenada cricket team from 1964 to 1966. In 1973, he was made captain of the Grenada cricket team, as well as the combined Windward Islands and Leeward Islands youth team. You know, a good friend of his said to me, and he'll probably know where that came from, this man go die believing that cricket in the West Indies will change. He taught at the Presentation Brothers College and was a mathematics professor at Howard University between 1977 and 1983. He also started his consulting firm in Washington, D.C. and subsequently worked as a professional consultant to many government departments and private corporations in the United States. In 1984, he was elected Member of Parliament for St. George Northwest and has held his seat ever since. From 1984 to now, 2018, this man has not lost his seat. He was elected political leader of the new National Party, a party he initiated, he created, and in 1989, he defeated the then Prime Minister, Herbert Blaise. During that time, of course, he served as the Minister for Communications and Works and Public Utilities, Cooperatives, Community Development, Women's Affairs, and Civil Aviation. On June 20th, 1995, our guest speaker successfully led the new National Party to victory in general elections, winning, I'll say, only eight of 15 seats in the House of Representatives. He took office as Prime Minister on June 22nd, 1995. In 1999, he led the new National Party to an unprecedented victory, winning all 15 constituencies. All 15, all 15 constituencies. He became the first Prime Minister, the first Prime Minister since Grenada attained independence to win two consecutive general elections. So that's the first. 
His portfolio, of course, at that time included the Minister of National Security, Finance, Trade, Industry, Planning, and Information, and later on, National Security and, of course, Information. This accomplished politician led the new National Party to another unprecedented victory in November 27, on November 27, 2003. He secured a third consecutive term of office. He held the portfolios of national security, human resource development, information, technology, business and private sector development, youth development. Her Majesty the Queen was so impressed, she appointed him to the Privy Council on February 20th, 2004. Now the new national party was defeated in the general elections held on July 8th, 2008 by the National Democratic Congress, and they only won four seats. But our guest speaker stood tall. He was re-elected in his constituency of St. George's North and continued to serve them as their leader. He was sworn in as leader of the opposition in Grenada on July 16th, 2008. On February 19th, 2013, five years later, his new national party defeated the incumbent Tillman Thomas and the National Democratic Congress, winning again all 15 seats. All 15, and the second time he was creating that history. On February 20th, 2013, he was sworn in as Prime Minister for the fourth time. On March 13th, 2018, this year, this year, March, just flip back, March, he led his new national party to yet another unprecedented election victory, making a clean sweep of all 15 seats for the third time. He took the oath of office of the prime minister for the fifth time. In his capacity as prime minister, this remarkable gentleman has served as chairman of the CARICOM community. He has served as chairman of the Board of Governors and Caribbean Development Bank. He has served on the Ministerial Council of Association of Caribbean States. He was chairman of the OECS. And he is currently chairman of the World Bank Small States Forum, chairman of the Monetary Council of Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, and lead head for science and technology in the CARICOM quasi-cabinet. He is currently, of course, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, National Security, Public Administration, Physical Development, Home Affairs, and ICT. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, please stand and help me welcome the indefatigable parliamentary representative from the Happy Hills of St. George's, Northwest, a great friend of our founding father, Sir John George Melvin Compton, the current Prime Minister of Grenada, Karakou, and of course, Peter Martinique, the Honorable Claudius Mitchell, to address us this afternoon. I nearly thought she was, she was <laughs> asking another person to come up here to speak. I didn't know it was me you're talking about at one time. My distinguished colleague, Prime Minister, and of course, political leader of your special party, yes. Chairman, Deputy Political Leader, Ministers of Government, Delegates, Sisters and brothers, members of the Caribbean family, it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Much pleasure. And I want to tell you something. I am usually not associated with losers, so you better bring home the goodies. You better bring it home.
But let me tell you something though. Let me from. Usually, when I'm in a meeting of this nature, I'm usually surrounded with a lot of green. It's the first time in my life I see yellow, 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 yellow. <laughs> But don't worry, the colors is not the significant fact, it's the heart that comes. It's the heart of love, the heart of love that counts. My friends, I have to tell you a little bit of my own history of St. Lucia. Because in the first time I visited here was 1965, as you figure I know how old I am, right? as a member of the Grenada team, um, playing at Mendo Philip Park. And of course, I was in high school at the time, 17 years a member of the team at the, that particular time. And I will never be able to forget that playing against Mendo Philip and the Morissette brothers and all of them. So the history, I go back long. And then I returned there in 1973 with the Grenada team captain. And we give St. Lucia a good whipping. We beat them by innings and something. <laughs> That's as far as cricket is concerned, my friends. But I have a long, passionate relationship with the UWP. This is the third time I'm addressing a convention of the UWP. And as you was quite this, rightly said a while ago, I'm seriously a protege of John Compton. I want to say it's a while ago when the sister was reading my biography, she mentioned the fact that the NNP, I was one of the founding members. But let me tell you, John Confern was one of the founding members of the new National Party. So, so people like himself and James Mitchell, I always saw them as, as father figure who helped mold in my politics throughout the years. And, and therefore, that's why I would always have a strong correlation in terms of relationship with the UWP. It's part of my heart. That's why I said, that's why I said a while ago, and I'm going to repeat, bring home the goodies in the next two years or two and a half years. Friends, I want to talk to you seriously about our region. The fact is, we live in a very difficult world. You read, you watch television, and you see what's taking place. Everybody talking about make their country great again at the expense of everyone else. The truth is, I don't know how you can make your country great again with no relationships. You have to have friends regionally, locally, internationally. And therefore, the world must be made up of countries that are understand philosophically their own ideology and work together to improve the lives of the people of their own country. So I don't subscribe to this philosophy of just make Grenada again, great again. Grenada can only be great again if St. Lucia is also great again. So all the countries in the region, we must all strive to make sure we all become great again or all remain great again. And that is why, my dear friends, only recently I partnered with my friend at the CARICOM Heads of Government meeting in Trinidad. It was a special meeting called to look at some of the fundamental weakness of the region with respect to our decision making where we, we go to meetings, we make decisions, we make announcements and we do not implement and the, reg the region is left wondering what is taking place. So we had that meeting and I want to say this with my colleague and your distinguished Prime Minister and the other Prime Ministers in Trinidad last week, we made some momentous decisions 
And I want to tell you this, having been in there for a long time, this was probably by far the best CARICOM meeting that I've attended. And I say this because we cannot talk about freedom of movement of our people. We are small countries. We need each other. We cannot talk about freedom of movement of our people and yet the people are not able to travel among the countries. Does not make sense. And therefore, we have to examine what is responsible for the lack of ability of people to travel. And as we see it, fundamentally, one major problem is the unavailability of transport. Sometimes if I have to come to St. Lucia, I have to go around the Caribbean to reach here. Now, how could I? Who has the time to be able to go around the Caribbean to our country? I just left this morning, thanks to my friend. I'm within half an hour, I was in St. Lucia. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm able to go back and go to a meeting tonight in my constituency. So, we have to have more transport, sea and air transport. But if we have it and it's too costly, we still don't have it. So if Grenada has a pile of taxes on a ticket, St. Lucia has a pile, Barbados has a pile, St. Vincent has a pile, Trinidad has a pile, and making the tickets too costly for people to tra travel, then we must drop our taxes and let our people travel. And we're not talking about dropping all of it. We're talking dropping sufficiently to make the ticket easy for people to travel. I remember seven, six years ago in Trinidad, I raised this, the need for us, all countries, to examine the reduction in taxes. And a certain prime minister nearly hit up my head. I'm not going to call his name because I'm in St. Lucia now. So, <laughs> I am not calling name at all. Don't say I say anything. I didn't call any name. <laughs> so we have to do this, my friends. We have several civil aviation authorities in the region making decisions and deciding which plane could come and which one cannot come. We have to done this foolishness. My friend has already proposed that we want have one civil aviation authority. We are too small to have these little pieces of organizations all over the place. And that's why you must stand with your prime minister and stand with a man that understands this. The other problem we have, I'm going to Grenada, my own country, and I get a form. How long you been out? What's your name? What's your age? You date a bot? Give me a break. My friend, we already agree. We have to stop that. We have to stop fooling ourselves. Fooling ourselves. Maybe make us feel good that we could fill out papers, but that don't make no sense. So we have to make it easy for people to travel my friends in many many ways and that's one of the areas we must do something about why we have to come to come to St. Lucia and we have to go to immigration we have to go to security there are technology right now available that you could do um, we, could, we could we could make sure someone is in fact facilitated to travel by the technology you know all about him before he reach this country you go to Miami these days and you hardly have to fill out any form and you walk through. So we have to do a number of things and I'm happy that in Martin, because I've been there long enough. My brother here is, is just starting his journey. So I, I want him to help me to get a good send off with the, having the CARICOM family be able to travel much more than they're doing at this time. And we can do the security. All of us have problems 
with security. Every single one of us. But you know the reason we have more problems than we should have had? We are not integrating our information services sufficiently. So something happening in St. Lucia, we should know in Grenada overnight. Something happening in Trinidad, we should know. Recently, that gentleman shot two people in Trinidad. And he ran to Grenada. Now, if we didn't have a very good system of checks, that man could have been roaming in Grenada without anybody knowing. We caught him within six days. But I'm saying, therefore, that should happen in every single country. There should need no escape for criminals destabilizing our society. Our children must grow up in a country of peace and stability. My friends, I'm so happy that we have your Prime Minister. And I want to say this further. I am not here to vilify anybody. I don't get involved in the, in the, the partisan political thing. As Prime Minister of our country, I don't believe in it. But what I can say is that you have a good man. Take care of him, help him, support him, and help build him even stronger than he is right now. My friends, a while ago, we talked about winning elections. I want to say this to you in my experience. I always make this point. Not everybody that vote for you the last election will vote for you the next time. Get it straight. You got to come to terms with that. Because some people, it happens in my country, I assume it happens in St. Lucia, vote for themselves. And they want everything. You give them the first thing, you give them the second one, the third one, the fourth one. The minute you say, well, I can't do that, I'm done with you. Bad word time. I am not saying that you should give up on them, but I'm saying you may not be able to convince everyone. So what that means, you have to reach out to your opponent, sisters and brothers. That I'm not talking about the hardcore opponent who might make up long before the moon, shine, moon got up. I'm not talking about them. There are people in every political party who are movable, so to speak, right? They're movable. Now, you must know them. And that's when, when you're on the ground in your constituency, you will know precisely this. So I'm saying to you, friends, you've got to reach out. i give you an example what happened to me. In 1984, when I ran the first time in my constituency, I got 60% of the votes. The opposition party got 40% of the votes. At that time, I was in the same party with Mr. Hubbard Blaze, George Brazan, and so on, who had his own party when we all got together, when John Compton and James Michelin brought us together. So we all united. And because of that united effort, we defeated the GLP, that's Gary Gary's party, and I got 60% of the votes. By the time the election was held in 1990, myself and Blaze fell out because I ran against him for political leader, but he was very sick. And he fired me from the government, and I told him thanks. Fired me from the government, and I ran the party in the next election. We lost the election because the party split. George Brazan formed his own party and he had support in my constituency. Hubbard Blaze had his own party and therefore had serious support in my constituency. So if I only got 60% of the votes in 1984 and I lost two key men in my party, logically, I should have been defeated. The election came, I got 71% of the votes. The point I'm making, Sister but if I had not reached out to people who voted for me the, the previous election, I would not have been elected in 1990. And that is the point I want to stress. And more than that, colleagues, this thing about voting, from my experience, and I'm pretty sure it's in Lucia too, 
people bought more on a personal basis than how much road you build and how much school you, you build. It's the strangest phenomenon, but that's a fact. You can build all the roads. You could build all the schools. You could have the economy running well. And I see it happening in St. Lucia, but if you are not on the ground, if you ain't grounded, you're going to be in trouble. Sisters and brothers, I'm giving, I'm giving you, I'm giving you as I know it because I've seen it happen over and over in my political life. And I'm saying to my colleague, Prime Minister, this. It's two and a half years. You have to do a review. You have to do a review. And my, my colleague, in the review process, it may mean that some may not continue the race. No, you don't give up on your own. You never throw out your own. But you sometimes have to be honest with your own. In other words, sisters and brothers, this is about winning. It's about winning, sisters and brothers. If you are talking about helping someone, help them. But when you're going for votes, go for win, sisters and brothers. And I, I, I say to my colleagues in my government, my party, you, you win the next election by the work and contact you establish within the first three years. And believe what I'm telling you. Because if you wait for the next election, you know what they tell you? Where are you going now? Where are you going now? Election coming, you're coming. So they may, may mean that may mean that the party has to examine itself. The last election in Grenada, we changed three candidates. And it was the hardest thing for me to, they were my personal friends. But I had to spend a lot of time with them, showing them that it's in their interest not to run, but to support the party. And I'm telling you, we won all three seats because of that decision that we made. So friends, I'm speaking to you as a friend. And I have to tell you as I see it and as I know it, you have to stir the pot and then you make your decision as you see fit. Another thing I want to, to urge you, our young people, you have to stay engaged in a very serious way with the youth of your country. Our people, at our age group of 40, 50, their minds are solidly made up, UF, UWP or, or labor. You may move some people here and there, depending on economic and other situation in your country, the environment. But the people are likely to be swung one way or the other is the young people. The young people. Because gone are the days when we knew it in Grenada, when your mother and father is a member of a party, you also drop your standing line. Then so again, my friends, the young people would have all the respect for the parents, but they say, Mama, you don't just step. I see something different. And that's why the need for every parliamentary representative, every potential candidate, must get down into the constituency and have serious rap sessions 
with the young people of the country. Now you don't go and try to tell them all kinds of fancy story because they ain't stupid. You have to be honest with them. Very honest with them. There's some things they would ask you for that you have to be honest like a father figure, a mother figure and say, well, I, I hear you, I understand you, but I cannot promise you this. This is important because they have to be able to trust you. Because if you keep telling them everything they ask for, you're going to deliver it, they will believe that you're tomfooling them. And that is something that you have to watch. So I'm urging your friends, treat this lightly, Sam, seriously. That your constituency organization, your party groups in your constituency, you can't get away from this. The technology you have now is available. Identifying everyone in your constituency who is a voter. Identifying having the telephone numbers, the, the social media is the way to go now. The campaign tactics of 25 years ago cannot be the same tactics now. It cannot be. Facebook, social media, they are the key factors that formulate people's minds in the 21st century. And I can tell you this, in every election we won, at the last election, for example, by the time two o'clock in the afternoon, we knew that we won literally almost every seat because the technology, what cannot go wrong, science is cannot be wrong. Science is right as long as it's done properly, friends. Now, so winning your second term is dependent on you, the soldiers. Now, you have a party and you have a government. There are clear lines of demarcation. You can't get away from that. So, we cannot expect that the, the party would dictate to the government on policy issues and everything. But the information and ideas from the party should come through the representative and through the prime minister that can influence the government decision. But it must never appear that we are attempting to, or you are attempting to, to use the party to control government in a way that sends the message that the government is just for one group of persons in the country. That is something, and that the prime minister is skillful enough, his team is skillful enough to walk that line carefully, because that is something that we have been watched. We have been watched regionally, internationally, how we operate, how we govern our country. And I think it's something that we have to be aware of. My friends, we in Grenada, we instituted a structural adjustment program, I think most of you would have heard about it, in the toughest economic time in the country in 2013 when we got back into office. Because to win 15 seat, where you had only four seats in opposition and 11 seats that the government had, and to win every, every seat in opposition, not in government, it means there were tremendous social and economic dislocation in the country. That, that is, in fact, the case. So we came into government with an economy battered. But what we did, we brought all parties together, the social, social compact, trade unions, government, NGOs, business community, and the churches. And I tell you this, and I told my colleague this, the church played a major role whenever we had those meetings. And any one of us start to be, misbehave, the, the moral leadership came into, into in when we start misbehaving. So they played a very sobering role within that social compact. Because to some extent, many of our, even how we operate government before, now clearly can be the same we operate government before. It cannot be the same way. Government historically used to behave that you can solve everybody's problems. Just vote for me and I will take care of you. That's the mindset. And to some extent, 
we have created a bad mentality in some of our people. Some of our politicians over the years have spoiled our people. The fact is, I say to people, vote for me. So we create the enabling environment that you can use your God-given initiative and talent to take advantage of the opportunities that are available. Because gone are the days that government used to just create programs and create programs and end up to tax people and tax people. It seems to me the better philosophy, and I know your Prime Minister shares this, is to allow people to have as much disposable income so they can take initiative and don't depend on one job to survive. There are other things you can do and take initiative. I even tell members of my police force, don't sit down and wait for the salary at the end of the month. Why can't you do a little thing on the side? As long as it doesn't conflict with your police duties. And I tell public servants in general this, because I think this is important because we have to admit that government has to change how it behaves. Similarly, the trade union movement historically has been, let me just get the biggest increase. I don't care, but this is one country. You live here, it cannot be a case where you push to get everything from the government at the expense of the entire society. So trade union, 50 years ago, used to talk about major increases. Everybody become popular overnight. Because anytime you talk money, everybody jumping up behind you. You become popular overnight by saying give 20% increase and this, that's easy. The question is what's the impact of this? on the overall society, including your own families. In other words, we have to talk about productivity. We cannot sit at the table in the 21st century and talk about increases without some measure of productivity because the money comes from productivity. And that's the same thing. We have to come to So trade unions, I tell my brothers, we have to change. So government has to admit its fault. Notice I talk about government first. Trade union must do the same thing. And the business community too. Historically, business was profit for the shareholders. Just profit for the shareholders. And then the manager and the business owner is far removed from the workers. That can't work these days. It can't work. You have to be seen as caring for your workers. Putting in place system that make them understand that you do care. Not just about the profit you make but about the personal problems of your workforce. I, I, I remember in 2006, I went to the United States. I was invited as the chairman of science and technology for the region. And I think it was the period when Al Gore was running for office. And he was launching his campaign at this major technology center in Philadelphia. And after the meeting, I was invited and went there. The vice president, and that's a corporation, is hundreds of billions of dollars in activities there they're involved in. And when I, he took me on a tour, and when I reached a certain section, he said to me, this is my office. I said, wait, no, that is the office of the vice president. This man must be making over 12 million, 15 million US dollars a year. Because it's just a little cubicle, all the equipment are there, but he's sitting there. And his staff, the secretary has the same equipment all around him. I said, that is, he said, Prime Minister, that is the concept of leadership in the 21st century. I am one of the team. You see that lady that cleans the office? She's an important member of the team. If she doesn't clean the office, we are in trouble. He was making a point because I'm coming from Grenada where if you don't give a staff a nice pretty office, some of them want bed in the office too. I don't know what they're doing with the bed in the office, but they want bed too. They want the nicest chair and the biggest space. That concept must change. I'm saying, therefore, a whole concept of how we operate is different. Now I'm saying to you, and I'm pretty sure you're doing some of it here, as much as possible, try to reach out to your labor, your labor unions. I have my own problem with some, but I don't get too mad with them. I have to differ with them on occasions, like I just had to differ with my, t my teachers, and I still love them, 
But you have to reach out, communicate. And it's important to have persons in your organization that have relationship. So when issues emerge, they can get to them with an explanation. Because a lot of times, conflict occurs and total misconception and misinformation, not facts. So I think it's important, and I'm already offering advice in that direction because I think it worked beautifully in Grenada with the relationship with the churches, the trade union movement, the NGOs. And in many cases, they were not supportive of my political organization, but we worked together. You don't have to be a UWP to play a role in the development of the country. Too much times in, our, in the history of our country, we put partisan politics first before the country. If something is good, if UWP does something is good, everybody should be on board. It's as simple as this. But we find a situation in the Caribbean and generally that when it's the government in office, then we oppose. So if something is good and because the next person is involved, then it's no longer good. My friends, I believe that you're on a good wicket. You have the foundation, you have a leader that genuinely shares his care for people. Someone who has excellent ideas in terms of the Caribbean and of course St. Lucia. I have seen him bat outside for the Caribbean and for St. Lucia. And I know with his initiative and commitment to St. Lucia that you will in fact be able to bring home victory as I expect you to do in the next two years. So with the commitment of your leader, with a solid team behind him, working together, marching together, and it doesn't mean marching together means you always agree, you know. I always tell people this. And many times I go into my cabinet meeting with one idea and the members, the members oppose that idea and I have to change. And that's what this is about. It's about collective responsibility, and sometimes we laugh and enjoy it afterwards. So, marching with him, working together, and with a team on the ground, sisters and brothers, whatever weaknesses, now is the time. Do not wait for next year. You see why Santa Claus coming? Walk with Santa Claus. Make sure you get back on the ground if you're not there sufficiently because that is where the action is. So while the Prime Minister is doing major projects, which will satisfy a certain section of the population, the man on the ground is saying, I ain't feeling it. So you on the ground have to stay in touch with the man and show him how he will benefit, not necessarily today, but it might be to tomorrow, it might be three months from now. But that's the work of the soldiers on the ground. And I am confident, sisters and brothers, that when that when you do this, I am sure that I will be celebrating with you two years and a half. Thank you all. I wish you all the best. I'll be listening, you know. I'll be listening. Bring home victory. I love every single one of you. Thank you.
United Workers Party 40th convention here at Marigo. We've just heard and seen the address by the Prime Minister of Grenada, Dr. Keith Mitchell. He called on the United Workers Party and its Let's foot soldiers to begin time, its work as early and not to wait late in order to get results. You would note that Keith Mitchell enjoys an overwhelming, a total majority in the island of Grenada with his government having won all 15 seats and creating something of a constitutional dilemma since there was no real opposition. So this was the main event here. This was the main event here for the afternoon. And we noted that the presentation which was supposed to have preceded Dr. Mitchell's address was pushed backwards. So it might be the next upcoming event at this convention. to remain alive and well and even in government today. So ladies and gentlemen, even before I call them, please let's give them a round in round of applause for all of them. <laughs> Honorable Prime Minister, so if you just... At this 40th convention, we're moving now to the presentation of awards, and uh, they are going to be presented by the Prime Minister and leader of the United Workers Party, Alan Chastney. From the constituency of Ancillary Canneries, we would like to honor Mr. George Prescott. <laughs> Mr. Prescott was not able to make it today, but we have someone from the constituency who will be receiving the award on his behalf. Constituency of Babono, we have Mr. Leon Louis. My Babono people are excited. John Henry. That's Mr. Blah. Let's go, Castry Central. Castries East. Mr. Michael Mafre from Castries East. Castries North. Mr. Hollis Bristol from Castries North.
Mr. Gilbert Isaac from Suazel constituency. Come on, let's head for Suazel, people. From me, could North, we have Mr. Andrew Roberts from me, could North. He's not with us, but someone will receive it on his behalf. Can the pal is there somebody or the rep? Oh, someone is coming. Let's head for me, good enough. Susan Randolph. From Viewfort North, we have Miss Cecil Edwin. Let's head for Viewfort North and Mikut South. I think Miss Edwin was there a while ago. She disappeared. Okay. From Viewfort South, Mr. Eldred Stevens. Also from Viewfort South, Mr. Nicholas Glass, but I don't think he's here with us today. Let's head for Mr. Eldred Stevens. Someone is receiving on her behalf. From Sufra constituency, Mr. Banaba Symphorium. Mr. Symphorium is not with us, but someone will receive it on his behalf. From Castries East, Miss Veronica Albert. John Noel from Castries East as well. From Grosley, we have Mrs. Gertrude George. Let's head for Mrs. George. She's not with us, but come on, people. We need to give it up for Mrs. George. And from Castries South, we have Mr. Rudet James. Let's head for Castry South. So from the party, we would like to honor 
Mr. Ira Dovey. Let's hear it for Mr. Ira Dovey. I think he deserves a standing ovation, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Dovey, Mr. Harrington Celestine, he's another stalwart, he's not with us, but let's give him a round of applause, please. Mr. Eric Brantford, to the Hall of Fame of the United Workers' Party. So our incoming chairman, Mr. Oswald Augustine, will read a short bio of this gentleman. Mamai Flabo! Service to party. He joined the United Workers' Party in 1965. His services were as follows. He was elected to the Castries City Council three consecutive times on the party's ticket from 1965 and was the mayor of Castries in 1972. He contested and won the Castries North constituency in 1972 and served as parliamentary secretary to the prime minister's office until 1979. 
the following positions were held by him in the United Workers' Party. Executive member in 1966, vice chairman of the party for 10 consecutive years, party chairman following the death of Henry Girodi, campaign chairman in several elections responsible for election financing and fundraising, currently chairman of the board of trustees. In the earlier years, he was the party's representative on the following statutory organizations, HUDC, the deputy chair, National Development Corporation, St. Lucia Fish Marketing Corporation, and chairman of the St. Lucia Broadcasting Corporation. I now present to Mr. Hollis Duncan Davidson Bristol, the Stalwart Award, which is going to go to our Hall of Fame for his unwavering support to the party and the constituency. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Political Leader, I had a heart attack 12 years ago. You nearly gave me another one. I thank you. I'm happy. I'm moved. I cannot speak. I work hard and long for this party. <laughs> a party which we work for. There's a friend of mine, in the dark days, we had a task, the 79 to 82 era, to bring this party back on the high level. He's here today, my friend Ira Dovell. We were a team, a team, not one man, a team of two. Besides that, there was a youth arm, and she just rest in his hair today, and Steve is somewhere hiding. It was them that started that youth arm, driving Begas van all over the country, blue van. They made that difference in 79 to 82. So I'm proud and I'm happy, I've got a little control now, to be recognized for my love for this party. I've always been in one organization all my life, CIO all my life. I did two Barclays and Beggars for 60 years, one organization is mine either. This party is part of me and I'm part of the party, and I thank you very much for my residence. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you, PM, for making the presentations and thanks to all awardees we are looking forward that the party is going to continue this tradition in the years coming yes we now move on to the next agenda item which is the vote of thanks following which we will have uh, some musical entertainment and then a political event where you're going to be addressed by some of our parliamentarians. 
So I now call on Mr. John, Nicholas John, to present the vote of thanks. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel Cleary. Uh, delegates, um, it would be remiss of me and the party not to recognize and to thank some persons who have played a critical role in making today's event a success. Not only today's event, but events leading up to today, namely the zonal uh, conferences and the dele delegate conferences that we've had so far. First and foremost, um, I would like to thank the Right Honorable Keith Mitchell for coming here and gracing us with his presence, but not only gracing us with his presence, but delivering a very inspiring speech. There's a lot to be learned from what he said, and I hope that um, delegates will leave here remembering what he has said and actually move on to implementation. So although he has left, I would like to thank him on behalf of the organizing committee and on behalf of the United Workers' Party for taking his time off to come to be with us this afternoon. In that respect, I would also like to thank our political leader. Sometimes we take things for granted. Not only was our political leader very instrumental in um, getting Sir Keith to agree to participate in our convention, but you could imagine the challenges that we, we would have had to get a man as busy as Sir Keith to pop in here for a couple of hours and to pop back out. And as a result of um, the political leader's connections, he was able to achieve that, and I really wish to publicly acknowledge his contribution to that exercise and thank him for that. We did have some ambassadors who, visit, who visited us during the course of the day. Um, they did not stay around for too long. However, um, in the absence, I would still like to thank them and acknowledge um, their presence here today. And it goes a long way in terms of um, making this event a better one. So again, on behalf of the committee and the party, I'd like to thank them for being here today. You saw a presentation in terms of video which outlines some of the things that the party has achieved so far. Very well put together. That video was put together by a gentleman by the name of Dale Elliott. Um, it was voluntary, and I would like to thank him for um, th that superb presentation um, and let him know that we fully appreciate his contribution towards today's event. Of course, we'd like to thank the media for attending and providing some coverage as to what has been happening here today. I would also like to party to thank some of the people who have participated in the, in, the, um, in the program. We had Mr. Hubert James and his team in terms of the invocation, and Selma Cauldron, Beryl George who handled the issues of, uh, relating to the elections, Andy Daniel which dealt with the issues relating to the constitution and presenting the drafts of the various zonals and delegates conferences, and also moving the, the motion for today. And of course, uh, Senator Fortuna Bell Rhodes for agreeing to and delivering a wonderful introduction um, to Sir Keith. I'd also like to thank on behalf of the committee, our outgoing chairman of the party, Mr. Emmanuel Cleary, who played a critical role in every event that we've had leading up to today's, um, today's event. And we have to recognize that all of that was done at a time when he's not in the best of health. So we wish him all the best and wish to thank him once again for his contribution. We'd like to thank the members of, the, of Castri South for welcoming us into the constituency. Um, and we appreciate their hospitality. And, and finally, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, I would like to thank the members of my committee who put all of this together. We had Nancy Charles, Oswald Augustine, Anicia Fowell, Hubert James, Catherine McPhee, uh, Lena Ladder Secretariat, and Joachim Griffiths from Beaufort South. So once again, to all of you, thank you very much. Brings essentially the, these events to an end. And there's one item left on the agenda. It says political event, and which will follow soon afterwards. This is HES's live broadcast of 
the United Workers Party 40th Convention. And we're just waiting to. Earlier, we just witnessed the last substantive event of the, the United Workers Party 40th Convention. Now, right here with me is the party leader and Prime Minister Alan Chastley. Your impression of the day's event? Look, it turned out exactly how we expected. We had some really great speeches. Um, I was really grateful to uh, Prime Minister Mitchell for coming here. Um, obviously, he has been a hero of mine and, and certainly should be for everybody in the Caribbean in terms of what he's been able to achieve. And clearly, I'm now a colleague, Prime Minister, and we've been working very closely together. Um, I'm very happy that we're able to deliver to the party the work that we're doing. We're actually at midterm of where we are. Um, we have a lot more work to be able to be done, but we need the support of the party to be able to continue moving forward. He was very instructive in some of what he had to say. Among them, he's saying that the, the, the incumbent party has to do what it has to do within three years beyond that time people seem to see it as electioneering and did that sound a bell for you it always has and that's why I've always said it takes three years in order to turn things around I mean we really inherited and I know that sounds like a, a recording but we did inherit a very difficult situation which has been uh, coupled with now the problems we're having on a global basis but not once has my party ever use that as an excuse we're extremely focused on delivering to the people of San Lucia we now have the evidence that the five to stay alive worked really well. The reduction in the VAT, um, the forgiving of the health bills, um, doubling the bus transportation and school feeding program, and giving an amnesty um, on your on, on taxes. That money went back into the into the into the uh, into the economy, and we've seen a 3.7 percent growth rate. We've seen a lower in the unemployment rate, and now um, the major projects we've been working on are about to begin. We're going to the house on Tuesday to be able to uh, seek permission to be able to borrow 150 million U.S. dollars, 100 million U.S. dollars which is going to the airport and 50 million U.S. dollars to the roads. The road, the, the, the loan that we have has a five-year monitorium. So we're going to end up spending about 170 million U.S. dollars um, on the airport, which will be the largest project in the history of St. Lucia. And we're going to be spending about 300 million EC just with the Taiwanese loan. Um, on roads. We also have the, the DFID loan uh, grant for $140 million and also the, um, the Japanese grant for another $40 million. All these projects are about to begin. So uh, moving into OKEU, starting to work on the new wing at St. Jude's, the new police headquarters are all part of the overall program that we've been working very hard. So now that we have the financing in place, we have the designs, work is about to begin. Okay, and uh, we've seen some serious social problems and which, you know, we haven't seen positive movement on. And I'm talking about unemployment among the youth, in almost 40 percent. And uh, then we have the, the, the crime situation, which seems almost intractable at this point in time. And how do you expect moving forward to impact those two major? Well, first of all, we have seen a decline in youth unemployment. Um, not, not as much as we would have liked to see.
But I think when the new numbers come out, given some of the things that we're seeing, and certainly with some of the major projects coming on, um, we've got the uh, horse racing track, which will be a significant employer of young people. We've seen the growth of Ojo Labs. Ojo Labs started off as 36 people, now is 270. We're expecting by the end of the year, next year to be 700. We've also seen growth in the IT sector. And now with the $20 million injection of money into the St. Lucia Development Bank, we're hoping a lot of younger people are going to come forward and start their own business initiatives as well. Uh, so uh, I think that the programs are there. The, the, the focus on understanding that that's a critical need in terms of turning around our young people is there. Um, so I'm very excited about those programs. In terms of crime, you know, uh, it's a difficult situation, but we have the new CCT cameras that are, are arrived already and are starting to go up. We have a new communication system for the police. Um, we're finishing off and reopening the forensic lab. We've built some new courthouses. Um, we are retraining our policemen and being more focused and certainly creating jobs in the rural areas and revitalizing the agricultural sector. Com combined, all of those things are to try to address crime. Crime is not just about policing. It's about trying to um, uh, affect the core, uh, core cause of or the root cause of crime in the first place. And that's going to require a little bit more time. But work in education is critical. Fixing up Sir Arthur Lewis College, getting more effective education system, fixing up the school. So we inherited a, a huge um, task at hand. I'm very proud of the fact that we've not been out there increasing the debt to GDP significantly. We've generated new revenue sources, so it's not to put pressure on the current situation and trying to address that as well as trying to deal with this issue with resilience. I mean, resilience and the climate change is a, a mammoth task that we cannot do by ourselves, and that's why we've been working with our Caribbean colleagues to try to resolve this issue. Okay, you're, you're at the halfway mark of your administration. What to you has been the, the, the single greatest disappointment? Um, you know, I, I can't really point to one. Um, I, I can't say I'm surprised. I'm surprised to some extent how deep the issues are um, and how badly uh, the infrastructure of the country was. But, you know, I didn't really uh, think about it a lot. We just started focusing on how we're going to get it resolved. What would you do differently if you were to come back? A, a new administration, Alan Shastney in charge, what would be done differently? Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, if, if, if there's any one thing, and it's what I keep on hearing people talk about, is that they want better PR. But the fact is, is there's a lot of information that's out there. Um, people seem to prefer bad news and they prefer the good news. Um, we've got to get people to be a bit more patient and at the same time to understand what the policies of my government are. And I think that that's something that we just have to continue to work through. I'm hoping now that there'll be physical evidence of the work that we've been doing um, that now we'll start winning some more people onto our sides. Look, uh, being able to get health care insurance is a mammoth uh, win for the people of St. Lucia. That uh, more vulnerable people in our society um, don't have to be worried about not getting access to quality health care. Two consecutive governments have, have been found it difficult to open up St. Jude's. We now have the solution at hand with that. Opening up of OKEU, um, the amount of money that we're pumping in now into primary health care services so that people aren't tempted to skip the primary health care service and go to the main hospital, but now can get more services within their community. The growth of our local government and the empowerment of our local government. All these are great things, I think, that as people start seeing them and see the effect of them, that I think that they're going to be very much excited about those programs. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. All the best. Yes, this brings our coverage of the United Workers' Party 40th Convention to an end. We're here at... <laughs> I'm visited here by none other than Mr. Guy Joseph. Mr. Joseph, welcome back. I saw you excuse yourself from the convention and you're back. Yeah, I, I had to attend a funeral of a constituent of mine today, so I took an early exit and came back for the other main feature of the afternoon. Okay. What are you looking forward to in what is effectively the back end of this administration, the last half, so to speak? Well, as indicated, um, the Prime Minister's speech and political leader at that um, would have indicated a lot of the things that we said we would be doing. And anybody who understands the process of governance would know 
that it takes time to get your own work program up and running. Um, it's not that we inherited a nice basket of projects from the, the previous administration or an economy that was doing well. We, we got into government facing many challenges. And I think that in the midst of all that has happened, the United Workers Party under the leadership of Alan Chastney has been able to deliver on the promises that we made to the people. Not that we have accomplished everything that we set out to accomplish, but it's evident that St. Lucia is on the right track to progress and development. Okay. How do you measure that, Mr. Joseph? You, you look at some basic outlines. The reduction in the VAT of 2.5%. We were told we are crazy. In fact, the Labour Party was saying, how dare you give up $52 million from VAT? What we have proven is that we were able to reduce the VAT, which means that $52 million that would have come to government have remained in the business and the pockets of the people of St. Lucia. This money has multiplied because right now, what we are seeing is the revenue collection of government is better at 12.5% than it was at the 15% when Labour Party was in office. So that's a clear indication that things are moving in the right direction. You see, everybody, have not felt, everyone has not felt the full impact of the progress in the economy. But it is evident that there's a better spread of the resources of the country. More businesses are doing better under the United Workers Party. And that is just a basic measurement that can be used to determine. So if we look at the unemployment, Labour Party came in in 2011 and they said that the three top priorities, number one was jobs, number two jobs, and number three jobs. And what we saw was an increase in unemployment. With what the UWP has done, we have seen a reduction in unemployment. Now we have to put that in perspective. More students have left school, which means that the workforce has increased, but yet still, the numbers of people working have increased also because for unemployment to be down ranging in the region of 21 percent is a fairly reasonable achievement Not although in a sense this is alarming and um, for unemployment to be 21 percent that means one in every five working person or persons in the job market is out of a job. I mean, you may have inherited something similar, so, but it is still so, very... So when we inherited it, it was one out of every four. So think of that, one out of every four. And in two and a half years, with all of the challenges that we are faced with globally, we have been able to see a reduction in unemployment numbers. And as I've said in the past, these are not things to boast about, because for me, until you get to single digit unemployment figures, there's nothing really to celebrate or to boast about. But I'm just giving you indicators that shows that we are moving in the right direction. Now, the informal economy, if we look at it from the standpoint of jobs created that are not necessarily captured, so if you look at the stimulus that is done by the United Workers Party, take my constituency as an example. The Labour Party would employ one person for seven days, three times a year, and they would do 100 persons on each round. So that made it 300 people. Every round of stimulus, I employ between four and 500 people, and they do 10 days of work, which is equivalent to $500, as opposed to the 350 that they were getting. So if I just use this basic formula to show that while this is not something to boast about, but it is showing that the expenditure being undertaken by the United Workers Party is far more than what the Labour Party did. If I use the silting, 
on the whole island, the Labour Party was using about $1.52 million on the silting. In this year alone, under the United Workers' Party government, we spent over $4 million in the silting. And we have seen the dividend in that with all the rain. We've had just some very minor flooding in the Bexor community, an area that is so prone to flooding. So obviously, I am very elated that we are showing signs and we have not hit the third year because the prime minister, when he was leader of the party, he said, look here, we would need three years to begin to turn this economy around. And, and you think you're going to hit that target? We've, We've achieved the target of beginning to turn things around. We had a 3.7% growth. As the Labour Party, when in their 15 years of administration, we had that kind of growth in St. Lucia. So the evidence is there. Everyone may not have felt the full impact of what is happening, but I know that this government is on the right track. And the convention today, if you realize most of the positions on challenge and it's not because people did not have the opportunity to be i was offered to be nominated i said no i'm happy with the team that we have there and i'm working with the team so while constituencies came to me and said to me look at i said we are in government and it does not matter what position you occupy in the government the people will judge you on what you deliver in representation. Thanks a lot, Mr. Joseph. Uh, <laughs> a phenomenal PR piece from Mr. Joseph, who is the member for Castries South East. I hope I got that right. And uh, so we're signing off here from the 40th Convention of the United Workers' Party. We're here at Scenic and Historic Marigo. We're at the Marigo Secondary School. And this is Sunny Lucien signing out and back to master control over and out.